Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Jonah Goldberg, senior editor at National Review, a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and frequent Fox News contributor. He's the author of 2008's Liberal Fascism and 2012's Tyranny of Clichés, How Liberals Cheat in the War of Ideas. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Jonah. Hey, it's great to be here. So I'd like to start with your background. Uh Um, Do you have – are you a – a, uh, by birth, a conservative by ver- birth, or did you have a click experience? Do you have some sort of dark leftist past? Um, um, I, 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 I may have had some dark leftist weekends, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but no, no, no sinister past. Yeah, so I grew up. I mean, uh, people who've heard me talk about this before will remember some of these jokes. But you know, I grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Okay, that's pretty. We were like Christians in ancient Rome, mm-hmm. right? We were like <laughs> one of the very few conservative families around, and um, you know, sort of. You know, I always joke about how you know you would meet in Riverside Park and draw a little C in the dirt with your foot, <laughs> and you say, "I'll meet you in the catacombs under Zabar's." Um, and so. Um, you know, it's one of those parlor games you get into a lot with libertarians and conservatives and people, sort of people who understand that they're ideological. Is like, would we still be us if we grew up in, say, the Soviet Union? Right? You know, I mean, there are those kinds of questions, and um, I sometimes wonder if I had grown up in some socially conservative neighborhood. We're being in, reactionary, but being something different. Right. Yeah. Where in Missouri would I have been a contrarian by being a liberal? I don't think so. But you never know, right? It's an interesting contrafactual. So I always saw being conservative as being sort of against the grain in New York 1970s, 1980s and all that kind of stuff. Um, my dad was a huge influence on me. Uh, my dad was a classic sort of – he would not have – I know he didn't call himself a neoconservative. But he was a neoconservative in the sense that he had a long dark leftist past or at least a short dark leftist path. And moved rightward. So very much like the Irving Crystal. Very much. Like, yeah. When I first came to Washington, Irving reminded me a lot of my dad. And my dad's um, idea of a good time was going on long walks with his sons and explaining to them why Stalin was a bad man. And so I, I don't know that I was conservative from birth. The thing about me is that I never planned on going into this line of work. I wanted to write comic books and science fiction novels when I was a kid and I kind of fell over backwards into this. Um, it wasn't until I really went to college that I realized how immersed I was in politics and media and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not saying I found out I was smarter than people. I was rejected from every college I applied to. It's just I knew things about politics and history and culture that – um, normal kids didn't, and I, I don't. I don't mean that to brag. I just mean that that, that that's sort of what was going on in my house. Is that we were, it was a lot of conversation. My dad subscribed to partly for work, but you know, to probably twenty newspapers and forty magazines, and we were just sort of drenched in all that stuff. Now you mentioned the people who know their ideological, which which made me think about the interesting fact that conservatives and libertarians, when asked questions like this. We'll often talk about what the left has called, or the feminists like to call, the click experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, that it's different. I don't know. If, I don't know if the left gets the question of like, when did you realize you were left? But conservatives right. and libertarians get this often get this question: Was it someday? And then you realized. Why do you think that's the case? Well, I think there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, part, you know, I have this long spiel about how there's a reason why uh, comedians are wildly overrepresented, o- overrepresented by. Uh, Blacks, gays, Jews, um, and Canadians. <laughs> and <laughs> the real subversive element. Well, no, <laughs> but, but for all the same reasons, right? I mean Canadians are observers of American culture but they are not part of it. They get a huge amount of their television and their pop culture from America but they're also slightly alienated from it. You know, you don't have to read Invisible Sun or any of that kind of stuff to understand that to be black on a mainstream, conventional, mostly white campus meant you had to understand your own culture and also the majority culture. Same thing for Jews. Same thing for gays. And that gives you a certain amount of critical distance um, from the mainstream while still understanding the mainstream. And again, that's sort of that half layer of alienation that – and comedians have that same thing. They have this ability to observe life as if it is something – Beyond them, like aliens watching the planet, kind of. But they're also very fluent in it, right? And you know, you look at John Stewart. I mean, one of his brilliant things is he could speak the language of pop culture probably better than anybody alive. Um, And so, anyway, uh, I think there's something similar goes on with conservatives and libertarians in the sense that 
we understand the mainstream culture. We understand the mainstream intellectual culture, but we're not of it. And it gives us this ability to talk about it with a certain amount of critical distance that I think um, I think is very good and very helpful and is one of the reasons why libertarians and conservatives by my lights tend to be, first of all, more objective and correct. <laughs> um, uh, but it also means that we are seen as slightly the other. Yeah, and But on the John Stewart point, which uh, just popped in my head, which is an interesting question because you mentioned the comedians and some things that come up every now and then is whether or not conservatives can be funny or do a thing like John Stewart right. or what John Oliver is doing now. And a lot of times when conservatives and libertarians have tried to do that, it's, it's failed pretty miserably. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been very clearly ideological in a certain way. Uh, do you have any theories about why it's the oh, case yeah. that no, we I get asked about this. That? I get asked about this a lot you know, in, far, in part because I'm, I'm sort of – Known as a conservative who can crack a joke, right? And um, some people, you know, say that I'm the I'm the funniest scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, which is sort of like it's an August list. Yeah, it's like <laughs> the best Oktoberfest in Orlando. You know, it's it's saying something, but just not a lot. Um, but um, no, I get asked about this a lot. I, I think that that part of the problem is that most of the attempts to do a conservative version of John Stewart lie in the fact that they try to do a conservative version of John Stewart. John Stewart doesn't go out to try to be or didn't, you know, he's he, we're recording this shortly after Trevor Noah just started as the new host, which I haven't seen him yet. Um he didn't set out to do a liberal show. Um it became more and more liberal over time as he be, became sort of the dashboard saint of sort of the left-wing blogosphere and all that. But um he set out to do something funny. And that's a very different thing and I wish um, these attempts which keep coming back sort of like herpes for conservatives to do these funny right-wing shows. I wish they would stop trying to, so hard to be conservative I mean, it's sort of like Trotskyite art, right? And instead just try to be funny because it turns out that actually a lot of stand-up comics are conservative and really libertarian. I mean it's – and they're getting more libertarian by the day. As college campuses become these sort of bizarrely sort of nerf bat Stalinist outposts, right? I mean, they're not going to, no, no one's going to get shot, but you know, you, you can't tell a joke anymore. That whole controversy was with Seinfeld and whatnot. Um, you know, and Amy Schumer's come out. Amy Schumer is clearly left wing in her politics, but she's actually becoming. A lot of these people are becoming essentially libertarian free speech warriors because they recognize the the way that a lot of the culture is going and. Um, and that's fine. But I think there are plenty of libertarian and conservative-minded funny people out there. Um, the part of the problem is that the people who assign who, – who produce these shows and the networks that sign up these shows, um, they want um, – either they don't, they don't think conservatives are funny because they're left-wingers, right? Or if they want to sort of counter-program and do something conservative, they think the smart thing to do is go hire a conservative to be a funny conservative and that automatically politicizes it. It removes from the conversation a lot of good material. I mean I used to be a big defender of The Simpsons in part because it's not that it was ever a conservative show. It's just that they were equal opportunity. And if they could get – or, so, or South Park for that matter. Or South Park. I mean, South Park is actually very libertarian particularly compared to The Simpsons, although I haven't watched The Simpsons much in a long time. But you know, my argument about The Simpsons was always that if there are 50-50 equal opportunity guys shooting at Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, that is about 48 percent more than conservatives usually get in the popular culture and we should claim that as a victory and move on. Um, so that's all right. I got that. Trevor So and you've been talking about conservatives and libertarians. Um, you consider yourself a conservative. Uh, why aren't you a libertarian? Trevor Burrus Oh, um, well, the way I kind of explain it to people – and I, I, I've gone around the horn. You know, writing liberal fascism, my first book, uh, made me much more libertarian. Um, um, and part of the problem is early on in my years as a as a pundit type, I got into a lot of fights with a certain subset of libertarians. And <laughs> There's a lot of subsets. Yes, of I, I, know I, I've gotten into many fights with them too. There, there are many rooms in the mansion of libertarianism, <laughs> which is one of my big beefs about libertarians is that libertarians, when arguing with non-libertarians. They argue as if libertarian is this unified ideological whole and that libertarianism is the one consistent ideology. And then when you put 10 libertarians in a room and you discover there are 15 positions on something, you turn out that that's mostly BS. And I, I really can't stand that insider-outsider stuff. Conservatives at least acknowledge that we got a lot of differences inside of our tent. Libertarians tend to have this 
We'll have all sorts of fun arguments when the tent flap is closed. But when we argue with non-libertarians, we're all going to act as if we're all in it together. And I, f I find that kind of grating after a while. But anyway, um, you know, one of the ways I, I like to explain my position is that at the federal level, I'm essentially 95 percent libertarian. If you can take out foreign policy, which I think you can, right? Um, uh, at the federal level, I'm about 95 percent. Well, 80 percent libertarian. It kind of depends on how – some issues I'm sort of off reservation. At the state level, it's more like 50-50. And at the local level, I'm pretty much a hardcore communitarian. If a local – there are certain things – there are certain rights that we all have to have guaranteed. You can't bring back slavery. You can't bring back Jim Crow. We fought a civil war over these issues. It's settled. We amended the constitution a couple of times. Done, right? But beyond that, if some local town wants to ban gay weddings or ban – uh, um, or or allow only gay weddings, right? I mean, I, I don't really care. Or um, maybe ban guns, with, or ban uh, I mean, well, the Second Amendment. There, there's a problem there, right? So uh, there are some issues that, by their very nature, become f quote unquote federal issues. But my druthers would always be to err on the side of saying these are local issues. You know, I mean, Johnny Cash wrote a song, you "Can't bring your guns to town," right? Um, and if that's a local ordinance, it bothers me a hell of a lot more than if it's a federal ordinance, right? Because then there is no right to exit. And I do this whole thing on college campuses about how I think that, that federalism, you know, basically the process of pushing public policy issues to lowest democratic level possible is the best system ever conceived of for maximizing human happiness because it lets the most people live the way they want to live. Some people will live very conservatively in ways that a lot of people at the Cato Institute will despise and some people will live very libertarianly which will um, – people at the Cato Institute will celebrate. And a lot of people will find a happy compromise in between. But the beauty of pushing these things down at the most local level possible is that the winners have to look the losers in the eye the next day. They have to see the losers at, the, at their kids' soccer matches and on the line at the grocery store. And they have to live with the consequences of their decisions. What we have now is we have a system where we have these competing elites, not to get all Mosca and Pareto on you, but we have these you know, competing elites at the federal level. And I think conservatives do it less than liberals and leftists, but they still – some do it where they say, well, the, the federal government is going to impose one side's vision. I'd rather it be mine. And they, they try to do a one-size-fits-all understanding of what this country is about. Um, that's not what this country is about, right? I mean, Barbara Streisand gets to live whatever kind of life she wants to live, and John Ashcroft <laughs> gets to live whatever kind of life he wants to live. But and we they don't, don't have to make them live together. That but we be, don't have to make them live together. That would be a reality show. That would be, that'd be a fantastic <laughs> reality show. But they also don't get to impose it on everybody else. And so, uh, so on a lot of issues, I'm very libertarian. On a lot of issues, I'm very conservative. It, it just kind of depends. Um, the one thing I think ultimately the problem, and I, partly the reason this is so fresh in my head, is I just wrote. The new forward to this what is uh, conservatism book that Frank Meyer put out, which is sort of the Federalist Papers of fusionism, right? And I think fusionism is a bit of a problem. You know, this is uh, philosophically it's flawed. It's this idea, you know, in National Review, where I hang my hat most of the time, is an avowedly fusionist enterprise. And the argument, the the, the pithy description of it is that. Um, you, a free society – a virtuous society must be a free society because virtue not freely chosen isn't virtuous. If I compel you to do the right thing, you aren't doing the right thing for the right reasons and you get no credit for it. You have to want to choose the virtuous path. I think as a political organizing principle, that's great. Um, it served the conservative movement and the libertarian movement quite well for over a half a century. But at the philosophical level, I, I think there are problems with it and you know the, the sort of – Jokey summation I have about libertarianism has always been libertarianism is the single greatest political philosophy ever conceived of except for two weaknesses, children and foreign policy. And if neither of them existed, I, there's no sane argument for not being a libertarian. Um, but we do have to take some care about the kind of citizens we raise in the next generation and that means um, uh, a certain amount of, for want of a better word, uh, enforced conformity or authoritarianism or how you want to uh, – however you want to put it. Um, and we do live in a world where the Hayekian extended order tends to stop at national borders and there are people 
beyond those borders who want to do things that requires a strong national defense. And that's, that's, that's where, where I come down on all that. You mentioned when you were writing Liberal Fascism, which is a, a spectacular book, uh, greatly influenced a lot of – reading your footnotes or reading your sources influenced a lot of further research of mine. But you said that you started becoming more libertarian. Was it kind of the fact that, that there is a vein of conservatism – not necessarily fascist, but in terms of creating a, a state family, create, socializing people in a certain way that kind of starts to seem like the kind of fascism that Mussolini p- practiced and things like that. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, uh, I guess the question is sort of a question I asked Charles Cook at a, the event we had on the conservatarian book uh-huh. was: you know, Would conservatives be against state education? Or if they controlled the curriculum, is it? I mean, in that right. kind of family building, that kind of right. state building, which you see in fascism traditionally. Well, I mean, this sort of gets back to the earlier point I was making. If forced to choose between competing state ideologies or ideologies of the state that we're going to impose on people, I'll choose the conservative one every, almost every time, right? So if we're going to play that game. And I got to pick a side. I'm going to pick the conservative side because I think there'll be less damage done to the society. But I'd rather not play that game, right? So there's this there's this ancient tension within the conservative movement of those who are anti-state and those who are anti-left, right? And seven out of ten times that distinction is written on our hearts, right? Because we're both anti-state and anti-left. Um, you know, are you and your question about Schools gets to the heart of it, right? I mean are you anti-government schools the way Milton Friedman would talk about it or are you anti-using tax dollars to impose this left-wing ideology on our kids? And if we could just get in the time machine back to the 1950s where they didn't do that, would they be OK, right? Um, I don't think necessarily either strain of those things is fascistic in the way that we're talking about. Um, uh, I do th- – you know, because I think – and we can get in the weeds on this if you like but you know, Friedrich Hayek – I, I am – it's sort of one of my pet things is I cannot stand the the misuse and abuse of his essay called Why I'm Not a Conservative. <laughs> Me too. I, I, we're on the same page. Yeah. Here. And so you know, Hayek never called himself a libertarian. He called himself an old wig, old wig yes. which is exactly how Edmund Burke described himself. And, and Edmund Burke, as many will remember, was the founder of modern conservatism. And the conservatives that he was talking about are blood and soil conservatives of Europe, the demise types. And that was never what conservatism in America was about. And that's why Hayek says America is the one country in the world where you can call yourself a conservative and still be a defender of liberty because what we are trying to conserve is a classically liberal revolution. Everything would be so much easier if, if libertarians could finally junk the most euphonious words since uh, – until conservatarian came along <laughs> um, and just call yourselves – Liberals or classical liberals, right? Which is really what most of you are. I would love to be able to do that. Yeah, you notice that's why I don't like to call liberals liberals. I like to call them leftists. Because yeah, or I'm progressives. T- right, I'm taking mean, it back. Yeah, yes. no, I, I agree with that. If we could do that, that would be wonderful. And it's a very recent innovation to to say it otherwise. Um, but no. So what made me just get back to your actual question? The what, the fundamental thing that I took away from writing liberal fascism in terms of this conservative libertarian thing is that, and I can do this. I do this whole riff and speeches about it, but. I call it the fundamental category error in politics and this category error is a mistake that libertarians never make, conservatives only rarely make and that progressives or leftists um, hold dear as the center point of their entire philosophy (laughs) and it's simply this. The government cannot love you, right? It cannot be your mommy or your daddy or your tribe. It can't give you – fill the holes in your soul or any of that kind of stuff. It can only be government and that means it's good for a handful of things. It's OK for a few more and then it's really bad for the rest. And that's, a, that's the one – you know. so Chesterton – there's this great discussion by Bill Buckley about Chesterton and the importance of dogma. And Bill actually got his example wrong in this as Virginia Postrel once pointed out to me. But um, uh, you know, he says, look, you know, we learned from Chesterton that dogma is important to constrain the realm of what is acceptable in a society, right? Um, and he says, um, you know, you're quoting Chesterton, he says, you know, the purely rational man will not fight. You know, the purely rational soldier will not fight. The purely rational man will not marry, right? I mean, you have to have a larger sense of your place in the universe and your meaning and all of the rest in order to do some things that we need you to do in a society. 
Um, and then he says, you know, look, he was arguing with Murray Rothbard. He says Rothbard thinks that people should go and char- that lighthouses should be able to charge boats for the use of their lighthouses. Now it turns out, as Virginia Prestrell, you know, and Mike Lynch once explained to me, that in fact that happened all the time, it, it right? Happen, but yes. Buckley didn't realize this. But his but his larger point is the correct one. He's he viewed he said he's a great line there. He says, look, um, you know. A country that is constantly debating whether or not we should privatize lighthouses probably won't socialize medicine. And um, I think sometimes libertarians take this category error point too far and see themselves as atomized individuals and all the rest and don't give enough space to the possibility that part of being free is to live conservatively in a conservative community which does – which is allowed to impose restrictions on the individual. but at the same time, if everyone believe, if everyone had the libertarian position, government would make a fa- far fewer mistakes and we get into far fewer trouble because dogmatically it is almost impossible for you know libertarians to impose any kind of tyranny. Yeah. Uh, the question I have here, which is, I think we've kind of taken over uh, answer to some extent, but some libertarians who might be listening to this would resist. The categorization of being on the right, and this might just sure. be an example of the one house, many many rooms sure. kind of example. But but a lot of libertarians think it's unfortunate. Some people here at Cato, uh, we're not clear why we usually get categorized with heritage when half of our opinions are on the left. Uh, do you think that there's a, a good reason that libertarians are on the right, or is it just a historical fight against communism, or is there something about libertarians and conservatives you think that are generally, except for maybe some some dif- some differences? Uh, generally the same kind of approach to the world. Yeah, um, I think for the most part, libertarians belong on the right. I think libertarians bristle and can't stand being up for the most part on the right, but they are. And the reason for it um, is simply that um, – well, no, I shouldn't say simply that because I think – and there isn't a single reason for it. I think it's what social scientists would call an overdetermined phenomenon. There are a lot of reasons for it. Uh, one of them has to do with the history of anti-communism. Another one has to do with what I was getting at earlier about how conservatives are defenders of a of a classical liberal revolution, and so are libertarians. And so, even though the conservative argument may be may be more deeply rooted in cultural heritage kind of arguments and all the rest, um, at the end of the day, conservative constitutional scholars and libertarian constitutional scholars. There's an enormous amount of overlap there, right? Because both sides actually believe the text means something, and all the rest. Um, I think that, now, is that does that speak to something itself, uh, in the sense that why would both sides think the text means something? Is there an underlying causal factor? One of the things you write in Tyranny Clichés is that conservatives are more honest about their indebtedness to ideology, which I think is true of libertarians too. Oh, it's absolutely true of libertarians, which I think I acknowledge in the book. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, yes, I, you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, look, I mean. We're dorks, you know. You walk around Washington, and you know, I've been I've been here for almost twenty five years, right? I mean, like, we literally have kids, really smart kids, wearing their favorite philosophers on their ties, right? I mean, <laughs> we're like a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons geeks, right? I'm a level nine Hayekian, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and I think that's wonderful, right? Um, and I do think this is one of the things that unites for the, certainly intellectual conservatives and intellectual libertarians. You know, there's something different when you get down into sort of raw populist kind of emotional stuff. But at the at the philosophical and intellectual level, we're united by an enormous number of things. With uh, constitutions, one an understanding of the role of the state within broad confines is another. Um, um, you know, this is a point I often make. Uh, on the single area that matters most in public policy, um, um, which is economics, right? I mean, other than our, sort of our fundamental constitutional rights, where we also largely overlap, um, there are no, at least prior to Donald Trump, um, there are no um, economic conservative economic thinkers. There are no libertarian economic thinkers who aren't also essentially conservative economic thinkers. Your hero economists are my hero economists. You know, it's Milton Friedman and and Adam Smith, and you can go down a long list, and Thomas Sowell and all these kinds of guys. There's there is no separate group of just libertarian economists. Of just libertarian economists or just conservative economists. I mean, there, I mean there, there, there might be some economists who are very conservative. Um, but their economics is but the their same. economics is Perfectly, they would fit in just fine here, 
right? I mean, the, the protectionism just simply doesn't exist among conservatives, again, pr- at least prior to Donald Trump. And so I think that that's – so that's part of it. And then the, the other thing is that we are in, in contradistinction to liberals and leftists. We actually take ideology seriously and we take ideas seriously. And I'm not, this is not to say that there are no serious intellectuals on the left and all. Of course there are. But are there anyone wearing ties with their favorite philosophers? But that's exactly right. You know, and and, and um, E.J. Dionne actually writes about this in one of his books. He says, you know, look, I mean, liberals just simply orient themselves to politics differently. That conservatives tend to, we're, you know, conservatives and libertarians tend to be ideational. Um, that, that is, we rally around certain ideas. Um, liberals and leftists tend to rally around – are coalitional and they, they – they, um, and they're activists. And I think that this stem – I mean I can get again deep in the weeds on this but I think this stems a lot from American pragmatism. I think it stems a lot from the fact that um, Eric Vergelin was largely right when he said that uh, for, to a very large degree progressivism or leftism or whatever you want to call it is in a sense um, a sub – is a political religion. And if it's, it's, it's fascinating when you go to – when you go to libertarian or conservative egghead confabs, right? It's a lot of weedy, narrow intellectual fights, you know, all about Randy and this and Burke that and all that. And you go to left-wing ones and it's a lot of testifying. Trevor And registering to vote. <laughs> yeah. It's re- – it, well, yeah, on the political side, it's registering to vote. The conversation is all – very religious. It's, it's, it's testifying in the religious sense. I, I feel that we shouldn't live in a kind of country where X has to come at the expense of Y. Sing it, sister. Yeah. yeah exactly. and, and the idea that there shouldn't be trade-offs, that, all, that there's a unity of goodness and that all good positions go together, um, that is a fundamentally religious point of view. It's a kingdom of, a kingdom of heaven on earth kind of point of view and is something that conservatives who tend to be – you know, a, a lot of them tend to be a much more religious bent. They already have their religion in a traditional form um, and libertarians – I mean I, I know there are plenty of religious libertarians but a lot of them, um, they, their religion uh, – they, they, they don't look to the state and to politics to fill that religious part of their lives. Um, and so I think that you know, it's funny because I think there is a tendency among libertarians to want to be cool. Um, I'll attest to that. I mean, I'm already cool, but I see. If I understand. Other well, people I mean, just sitting that. here, I'm just yeah. hoping some of it runs <laughs> off on me. But and um, and in the secular popular culture, conservatism is uncool, which is kind of funny, right? Because the whole point of secular popular culture is to be rebellious, and it's amazing. The one thing I love going on college campuses, and I always try to say, you know, look, let me get this straight. Your professors are liberal. Your textbooks are liberal. The publishing industry is liberal. The music industry is liberal. The mainstream media is liberal. The fashion industry is liberal. Your high school teachers were probably liberal. The administration here at the school is liberal. And yet you think you're sticking it to the man by agreeing with all these people, right? I mean if you want to be a real nonconformist, you know, be a pro-life Christian evangelical at Brown. Be, you know? be Alex P. Keaton be, yeah. be, from Family Ties. Wear a suit all the time. Young Republicans. So right. That's, so the, that's the thing is that so much of what counts as sort of rebelliousness is actually conformity. And I think that there is a – regardless, there is a, there is a tendency which I find grating at times for libertarians to try to prove that they are cool and more conversant and fluent with the popular culture by trying to throw conservatives under the bus. And the problem is at the end of the day is liberals will not have you. I mean, yeah, if the issue climate is all about um, drug war, drug and, war and gay rights, and, you know, to a certain extent they'll have you. But um, you're never going to get liberals to to replace the state with freedom. That that was a line uh, that Brian Doherty had when he was here talking about his Ron Paul book. He made a comment that the fact that Despite Ron Paul being more left than the left on the issues that they're supposed to be good on and they totally disavowed him or mostly disavowed him, proved to him that the left is only a party of sort of redistribution right. and social – it's like, well, all those things don't really matter. Uh, what really matters is whether or not you're for the corporations, whatever that means, and right. for redistribution. Right. Well, Brink Lindsay ran into this quite a bit when he Absolutely. was here with his – He's still here. <laughs> I thought he left. Oh, he came back. Oh, good. Oh, good. I like Brink. I'm a fan of Brink, but we have our disagreements. Uh, you, you mentioned the religious aspect, which is – which a lot of your writing, especially in Tyranny of Clichés, it's, it's very good for pointing out how political rhetoric is very self-serving a lot of time when other people have ideologies and you just have mm-hmm. things that work. For example, you brought right. out in one of Obama's speeches and you, you're very good at – one time I saw George Lakoff uh, 
give a speech to my class in law school and he said, the problem with liberals is that we're too rational, uh, which, which is interesting to me because I was like, well, of course, everyone thinks that. No one, right. no one thinks they're irrational and you're right. very good at pointing that out. But then it, often, it concerns me if we're going to categorize the left as or sort of pseudo-religious and whether or not we're pathologizing them in a negative way because it seems to me a bad thing if we think of leftism as some sort of – Disorder or religion, which I know you're not saying is entirely right. true. It just has elements of it. But a book like Dinesh D'Souza's The Roots of Obama's Rage mm -hmm. is, a, is kind of doing the same thing of just being like, well, let's try and explain Obama via other – something else than just trying to address his ideas sure, and sure, explaining sure. his ideas. So do you ever have concerns about pathologizing oh. our opponents on either side? Oh, yeah. No, no. Look, I mean obviously – look, I mean some of that is just simply endemic to politics and it kind of drove me crazy that people thought – you know, I don't want to get into Dinesh in particular, but thought that, that – that somehow Barack Obama passed Obamacare because his father was an Igbo tribesman <laughs> and whatever. You know, it's like, well, some 245, 250 other Congress people voted for that law, and they it's been a main part of Democrat thought for 20 for, years, right? So the uh, if not if more not yeah. longer, right? And so the idea that somehow it can all be explained by this otherization, you know, otherizing Obama, I thought was a real distraction um, and and truly problematic. At the same time, I don't think, you know, I, I'm a big enemy of 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 these. Uh, uh, I'm not saying you're doing it, but there's a, sort of an undertone of it of this sort of everybody does it false parallelism, right? Yeah, moral. I understand. Yeah, there's a there's a problem with that. I, I mean, mean, I think he, Buckley had the thing of if someone pushes a woman in front right. of a car and someone pushes them out of the front of the car, it would be like, well, everyone pushes women around. There's two different right. opinions. Right. I'm just saying it's it, sometimes it's concern. I prefer to try and think of my opponents as having arguments rather than pathologies. Right. Well, let's put it this way. Even though my tendency is to want to pathologize. Let's compare rather the let's compare you know let's compare Russ Roberts and and Paul Krugman, right mm -hmm. now. I, I think – They've had some fights, yes. I know they have, right? You know, and so Russ Roberts, who I've never met. Yeah, he's, um, he's, been on, he's been on here. But I'm a fan of his podcast and uh, um, Russ Roberts is almost to a fault willing to acknowledge the possibility that he suffers from confirmation bias. He acknowledges – he says, look, at the end of the day, if, you, if you're a Keynesian, you can find enough data to support your position and if you're not, you can find enough data to support your position. And ultimately, it's just a it's a muddle. And I, I'm always and he says he says it over and over again. He says it in debates with Krugman. I'm always open to the possibility that I'm just looking for the evidence I want to find. Right? Paul Krugman will never make that kind of concession. Paul Krugman says instead things of of profound asininity, like um, facts just have a liberal bias. Right? Now that is a better distillation of confirmation bias than anything you could ever come up with. And I think that if you, you know, when Barack Obama talks about how, uh, in, a, in that, I have that line, you know, I begin the book with this, uh, where he gives his speech the day before his first inaugural, where he says, We as a country need, need to have a new declaration of independence from small mindedness, bigotry, prejudice, and ideology. I bet those are things that other people suffer from. Right. He's always talking about other people. He's always talking about how he's not an ideologue. He's a problem solver. Now, s close to seven years into the Obama administration, the idea that you can have a you can have the view that Obama is great, you can have the view that he's been terrible, or someplace in between. But I can't take you seriously if you don't think he's ideological. I mean, I just I I, I literally think that you have a, your own ideological insane blind spot. If you think his only approach is to be a pragmatist and a problem solver and the thing is, is that conservatives and libertarians are willing to admit that they have an ideology. Now, ideology is not a bad word. I mean, yeah, there's some bad dictionary, dictionary definitions of it. But all the Frankfurt School definitely had their definition of it. Right. You know, and, well, it all, it all, and it all traces back to basically Napoleon and Marx who have this – they change what ideologue means to, me, to go from someone who cares about ideas to actually mean someone who's sort of been ensorcelled and has been brainwashed and all that and it's nonsense. Brainwash is another really good example of a term that you only call other people. Right. Like you would never describe yourself as right. brainwashed. Right, right, right. And so like Eric von Knut Ledeen, who I'm a big fan of, he – you know, for those – Looking to find him, he's been dead for a long time. He was this Austrian writer for National Review, and you know he makes a very good point. He says, first of all, in in Europe, ideology and worldview are simply interchangeable terms; they're syn synonyms for each other. Moreover, in America, 
about 95 percent of the sentences that mean anything about ideology, if you just replace worldview, you get it, right? All I mean by an ideology, it's not a set of principles that I'll adhere to when the facts disagree with my ideology. But it is, a, it, is a, it is a checklist of my principles. I believe certain things after thinking, thinking seriously about things, about reading history and all the rest. And I have came to certain conclusions about how the world should work and these are questions I bring to new facts. Um, the idea that somehow liberals aren't ideological about homosexuality, about guns. Social justice. Social justice, right? I mean you can go down a whole long list of things. The idea that they're taking each and every one of these issues – purely on an empirical basis, weighing the pros and cons and the facts is insane and yet they claim it time and time and time again. It is a tradition that goes back in liberal and progressive intellectual writings, goes back you know, over a hundred years straight through the pragmatist thinkers and it is a con. It is a way of saying your – Ideology is, you know, so like think of Charles Beard, right? You know, Charles Beard is this famous economic historian who says that uh, the founding fathers were only care only cared about protecting their own narrow economic self interest. Now, this has been completely debunked, um, but it's still hugely popular in all the wrong places, right? Um, um, and what he was really doing is he was promulgating his own ideological interpretation. What all these pragmatist types were doing was promulgating their own ideological interpretation and saying, no, we're just disinterested observers. We only care about the facts. Anybody who disagrees with us, well, you're like the founding fathers. You've got this ideology that explains all of your points of view um, and it is, it is a con. And it seems to me that in almost any other realm of life, part of being self-aware, part of being wise um, in the classical Aristotelian sense – is understanding your own biases, right? Is understanding the world that you – the way you want it to be, right? Because that's the only way you can check yourself to say, wait a second, am I just looking for the evidence I want to find? If you don't believe that you have that capacity, if you don't have an s- internal sense – I mean the idea that all, somehow Paul Krugman isn't out there looking for the evidence that he's always right about everything – is insane and the fact that he lacks the awareness to concede – to acknowledge that point is a huge indictment of his entire work. And it might, seems and to might be called a pathology. I yeah, mean, it might be or at least it's a mistake. Yeah, right. some sort of mistake. In liberal fascism, something I've always actually wondered about this. When you, when you wrote the book um, – and as you uh, say, fascism properly understood is not a phenomenon of the right at all. Instead, it is and always has been a phenomenon of the left. You also say many of the ideas and impulses that inform what we call liberalism come to us through an intellectual tradition that led directly to fascism. How did the left react to that book? Uh, <laughs> to you, I mean. So on one level, you, I mean, you're good at being like, I'm not saying you're fascist yeah. now, but but you also wanted to point out that it it matters. To some degree, to know the genesis of these, or at least they're not of the right, is right. the typical thing. But were they? Did you get any good responses from the left? Any, oh, I didn't even know that, or was it mostly just like you wrote a book that called us fascists and then you took a walk? Um, for the most part, it was a very disappointing reaction. Um, first of all, the book was attacked for two years before publication, um, which kind of inclines me to think that some of these people were not going to like it no matter what I said, right? And I understand that the cover is a punch in the nose and the title is <laughs> a bit of a punch in the nose and I get that even though the title comes from a speech by H.G. Wells. It's not something I – you know. And the cover is brilliant. It's a smiley face with a Hitler mustache. With it. Um, but uh, you know, a couple of years after publication, there's this guy. I can't even remember his name but he's one of these guys whose entire cottage industry is to say that – Conservatives are fascists, and that the we must be eternally vigilant, and sort of a classic. What's the the Southern Poverty Law Center type? Mm-hmm. One of these guys. Anyway, he can conv- classifying him as a hate group or something. Right. Um, he convinced the History News Network, which is a pretty good site, um, to do a seminar, a symposium on my book. And um, the amazing thing is, no one invited me to participate. And it's not like the author is dead, right? <laughs> and um, Ron Radosh, who is a great historian, intellectual historian, who gave it a glowing, wonderful review, by and, the way. And a real neoconservative. Well, kind of, he used to be of the left. And, he used to be a true communist, yeah. right? And um, I'm not sure he would call himself a neocon, but who knows? Anyway, um, he uh, he gave it a glowing review, and then he invited him to do it. And he, he said, "You know, shame on you guys that you're not inviting the person who you're going to eviscerate, right?" 
And so I was actually delighted by this thing. I was like, OK, finally, I'm going to get smart criticisms of this book, right? Because I think that most of the reviews were pretty bad. The New York Times one wasn't actually all that bad. But then when the, the fatwa went out that, no, we must destroy this book, not give it an inch of ground, the rest of them were – were mostly bad. I mean, Michael Tomaski was was sand poundingly stupid. Um, but uh, so the History News Network, they even got Robert Paxton, who's like the li- dean of living fascism historians, I guess. You know, and I gotta say, you know, none of them were particularly very good. Um, Paxton, I focused on Paxton simply because he was So did they write these down into a symposium? Yeah, and so everyone – you can go look it up. I'm sure it's still on the web and my response to them is still on the web as well. And they they score some points, you know, and some – which I'm happy to acknowledge. But on the the grand picture of it, um, I really wouldn't change at least the first half of the book, which is the historical part. The second half is a little bit of a screed, but – uh, and one of the reasons why it was so difficult for the left to deal with the book is I define my terms. Is I said, well, look, here is what I mean by left wing and right wing, right? And this sort of gets us back to where we started this conversation. Um, in American life, at least on liberal terms, right? So forget our terms and where we may or may where the schisms lie. On sort of conventional liberal terms, something is there are two pillars of right wingness in American life. There is the classical liberal pillar, right? Small government, limited government, free markets, free minds, Cato Institute, property rights, all of that stuff, the sovereignty of the individual. And then there is the cultural conservative pillar, right, of family values, tradition, all that kind of stuff. If you are very far over the line for either one of those categories, you are considered right wing. At National Review, because we're fusionists, we try to be both, right? We try to marry those two. But Cato is all one pillar, very little of the other pillar. And you're still – and we were talking about before we started how you get frustrated sometimes you're called a right-wing think tank. That's because to the left, if you don't think the government should be in charge and drive – is the engine of progress. That's it. Then you're right-wing, right? If that's how we're going to define right-wing, those two pillars, then fascism by any rational understanding of the phenomenon was not right-wing, Right. Now you could it was it was it, you know the Nazis hated Christianity, Mussolini hated Christianity. Uh you know uh Hitler said he wasn't a patriot, he was a nationalist and he wanted to bring he would never bring back the monarchy, he would never bring back democracy. Well, it certainly also had the 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 Whig view of history that the the progress is defined as like the next step is state is increased state Absolutely. control. Absolutely. Right. There's a deep deep doses of the Galenism. Well, and that's a huge it. element in sci-fi. Some sci-fi is better at this, but a lot of that centralization is synonymous with progress. That's right. And that a lot of that comes from Hegel, yes. right? I mean, and uh, Hegel and Marx, obviously. And um, and so the response to the book. I mean, I wish I had had better interlocutors. I mean, and and, and obviously I have I am. I have my confirmation bias here, right? I mean, but I, I never read a review of the book uh, from the left, at least, where I said, "Gosh, they got me." I mean, it's interesting. So the New York Times review by this guy David Oshinsky, uh, historian at the University of Texas, I think, um, he, you know, tendentiously but accurately describes the thesis of my book for the first couple paragraphs that fascism was a phenomenon of the left, that you know Mussolini was a man of the left, that it comes out of the left, yada, 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 that it was statism and centralism, yada, yada, yada. And um, it's only when I get to – F. he says, Goldberg is on less solid footing when he gets to FDR. What? Like, well, I'm like, Seriously? I'm like, well, game over, right? Yeah, because yeah. That's 132 pages into the book. By this point, I've said that Wilson was a would-be – Woodrow Wilson was a would-be fascist, that Mussolini was a man on the left, that Nazism should be understood as a left-wing phenomenon. And if you want to say I'm unfair to Franklin Roosevelt, fine. At but the I, same time, the Blue Eagle is a very disturbing fascistic type of thing. Oh, it absolutely <laughs> is. And there were you – know, and, and the, 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 the second-in-command of the National Recovery Administration, General Iron – General Iron – Hugh Iron Pants Johnson – was an open admirer of Mussolini, handed out fascist tracts in the White House. He hung a portrait of Benito Mussolini on his wall. Um, during the Democratic convention, he handed out a memo saying that, that FDR should be like Mussolini and send all of Congress and the Supreme Court to an island for 90 days. I mean the idea that I'm just simply asserting that there was some cross-pollinization here is insane. And, I, and one of the reasons why the book is so long and there's so many footnotes 
is because I knew that people would say I'm asserting things without evidence. And so I had to beat the crap out of the reader with evidence – with example after example after example. And the fact that so few people were willing to deal with the book on its own terms and instead deal with the straw man that the left wanted it to be was very frustrating to me but also sort of a sign of its success. And um, since then, you know, I've heard from a lot of sort of academic types always off the record, always sort of sub rosa that they find it useful. They actually invited me to come speak a, to a class on fascism at Harvard about it, um, which I thought was an interesting sign. And it's interesting. It's now in 11 uh, – I don't know. It's 11. It's, it's somewhere between 8 and 12 languages. Really? Um, and it's amazing. Whenever I meet people from Eastern Europe, they don't think the thesis is very controversial at all because if you lived under communism and then you lived under Nazism, you understand that they're really not opposites, right? I mean that, that at the end of the day – the intrusions into your life are so are so close to equal that um, almost the differences between them are aesthetics rather than than um, sort of some fundamental difference. Moving briefly to modern politics, insofar as as we have to occasionally live through periods of time such as this. There's a lot of discussion that's been happening recently about the rise. Uh, so we're recording this uh, in September uh, 2015. So the rise, the very of, end of September, the very end of September 30th. So the rise of outsider candidates, uh -huh. uh, extreme, somewhat extremist candidates, Bernie Sanders. Well, he's not necessarily an outsider, but then Trump, Fiorina, and Ben Carson, and then even people like Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. in the UK. Do you think that this is actually signaling – because we also have the incredible distrust of government in terms of distrust of Congress and distrust of not you know, record level lows. Is this indicating something broadly or is it just sort of primary free-for-all season that is hard to take any actual lessons from? No, I think there's something bigger going on. I mean and we can do the rank punditry part but the shelf life on that is going to be pretty short. I do think there is something larger going on. You have um, – you know, it's interesting. You know, in, in 1968, you had student revolts in the most heterodox number of countries. You know, from Mexico City to Bali to Indonesia, Budapest, to, I think. Uh, Budapest. Uh, well, across Europe and the United States and Canada and lots of South America, and um, the circumstances on the ground were obviously very different in different places. But there was something also just in the water then, right? I think there's something in the water right now. There is this sense I think across the developed and developing world that um, the that the nature of technology, the nature of the economy is getting out ahead of the people who claim to have mastered it, right? That we don't really know where things are going. We don't feel like we're getting any richer. Um, I think – I personally think inequality is BS as a serious issue. The only time inequality is a real issue is when it is a statistical symptom of a real issue, right? I mean so like if – Poverty and mobility. Right. If, if, if 20 percent – if the bottom quintile lost their jobs tomorrow, that would increase income inequality. The problem isn't in income inequality. The problem is 20 percent lost their jobs, right? And so – the the way the left talks about inequality, which is very Rousseauian, right, is very you know um, uh, abstract um, and, the full, and and separate from the real public policy issues, I think is sort of nonsense. But I think there are smart people on the libertarian and conservative side who talk about income and also on the liberal side who talk about in income inequality the right way that it's a symptom of something. But anyway, people don't like it, and there is this sense that it's increasing, right? And there is also the sense that. The elites – and I'm a big fan of Joseph Schumpeter and why he thought capitalism would come to an end was because the new class would sort of just take over and they would redefine civilization for their own benefit. I think we're seeing a lot of that. Um, and so I think whether it's the EU or the American economy or the Davos crowd or whatever you want, the kindling is there for a lot of different reasons. It's another one of these overdetermined phenomena. This kindling is there for a populist prairie fire. And Donald Trump is – Well, and that's the really or weird Do we want part, to right? – yeah, it is. I, mean, I, I feel like I should be wearing a piano key necktie saying I feel like I'm taking crazy pills here. But <laughs> well, um, since you work in National Review and you guys have been – all of you have been hitting him with, with – Body blows of extreme, of extreme uh, rhetorical flourish, and it doesn't seem to matter. Which is uh, yeah, crazy. no, and I know, and there are a lot. There's a lot of BS pop psychology about this. That like, oh, we feel like our you know, 
Our, our pundits don't matter. Our sinecure in the Washington establishment is evaporating and that's why we feel threatened by Trump and yada, 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 right? And so like first of all, the idea that somehow it is a great business strategy of mine to piss in the shoe – in the cornflakes of a big segment of the conservative base is insane, right? I would have been if – I, if I were driven by economic self-interest, the smartest thing I could have done is just not attack Trump at all, just stay quiet. And ride this out, right? But I think what is happening, the, the threat that Trump poses is a real one. Not that I don't think he's going to get the nomination. I don't think if he got, became president, he'd become a dictator. Um, I think this country chews up dictators. Um, uh, none of that stuff. What bothers me, what, what scares me is the way in which we're seeing conservatives and some quite a few libertarians – um, throw out their principles and their dogma and their ideology f out of anger at the quote unquote establishment and out of uh, essentially a cult of personality for this guy. And the example I've used the most often was you know there's a poll a couple weeks ago where they asked Republicans whether or not they supported single payer health care. Sixteen something like sixteen percent said they did. They were then told that Donald Trump supported it. And support went to 46 <laughs> percent. Now, if there is an issue that institutions like the Cato Institute and the American Enterprise Institute and National Review and Fox News has spent more time on the last five years than educating the American people why single payer is a bad idea and the one group that you would think would have been persuaded by that would have been the conservative base or the Republican Party, right? And at all it takes is being told that Donald Trump is in favor of something to abandon that in a heartbeat. That is really depressing to me. Another thing that's really depressing to me is the – and I don't for a moment think that Trump supporters are a bunch of anti-Semites and bigots. They're not. I mean these are my people. These are the people from reading National Review. These are you know, people from you – know, that show up on the floor of CPAC. You know, they're good people. But the bilious nastiness that Trump has unleashed um, that has been fairly surprising to me. Particularly because it's so stupid, right? I mean, the idea that stormfront neo Nazis would support Donald Trump is kind of insane, just on the merits, right? Um, and because Donald Trump isn't an anti Semite, and I don't think he's smart enough to be a white nationalist. I mean, I think he just doesn't know what the hell he's talking about, right? But um, these guys rallied around him because they see him as a battering ram to destroy the establishment. And th and so these trolls, some of whom I kind of think are probably getting funding from Russia have been saying insanely disgusting things. You know, um, uh, there's some that have Twitter handles that are literally pictures of ovens and about how you should get in the oven, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Um, when I responded to the, some of these jackasses making jokes about this guy named Joshua Goldberg who was arrested for faking being a member of ISIS and I just tweeted, I said, look, you know, my brother's name was Joshua Goldberg. He died a few years ago. I don't find any of these jokes very funny, right? The, the first response I got from that was, was he turned into a lampshade or soap? And so I've been getting this kind of stuff. My colleague David French has been getting worse stuff because he had the temerity to adopt an Ethiopian child, right? And which is, again, and, which is polluting our bloodlines according to these neo-Nazi jackasses. And so anyway, I don't hold any of that against Trump supporters. And I think it would be grossly unfair guilt by association to hold them against that. But when I was getting the the full wave of this crap, shocking, shockingly few Trump supporters would get in my timeline or send me an email and say, hey, look, I think you're an idiot about Trump. Trump is great, blah, blah, blah. But these guys don't speak for us. And I think under normal circumstances, if I was being subjected to this stuff, if David French was being subjected to this stuff, um, this was a normal primary season. You know, and I was criticizing John Kasich or or Rand Paul or whatever, and anti Semites for whatever reason were coming after me for that. I would like to think that Rand Paul supporters would say, "Hey, look, I think you're wrong. Rand's our guy, but these guys don't speak for me." And the Trump supporters basically just sat on the sidelines. And I, again, it's it's anecdotal. It's not a scientific thing. It could be impressionistic. A lot of this happened over Labor Day weekend. There are all sorts of explanations for it. But I, I've been doing this for a very long time. I've been in the middle of en an enormous number of social media and internet – You know, in, in internet years, I'm older than Methuselah, right? <laughs> so I've seen a lot of this before and 
again, it's my own impression. I wouldn't want to say that this was a hard and fast rule or come to any scientific conclusions. But you get the sense that, that Trump supporters are willing to – if they're willing to throw over opposition to single-payer health care, it seems like they're willing to throw over a lot of other things too. And that I find really disturbing. You mentioned you've been doing this for a while, the punditry business. Uh, and it, It's always changing. But in a broader sense, does, does this town – do you ever get tired of it? And so on some days – I mean maybe some days when it gets – but not, not, the, not the bad policies of this town, which conservatives and libertarians are always going to get tired of. But – the the dogma, the lies, the the in a, the bad arguments, the grandstanding, the political scandals, and it, and then you go on and have to comment it again, and you're just like, well, this is just SSD D, DD again. Yeah. Is it, do you ever get tired of it? Is it oh, just I, always changing? Well, I get exhausted with it. I get. I really cannot stand the the spinner class. Um, I mean, I have individual friends who or acquaintances who are in that class, but as a profession, I basically find it dishonorable. Right. I mean. I, I, I'm not a big believer in most of the sort of Jesuitical understandings of journalistic ethics and all that kind of stuff. But I do believe that my only job is to tell the truth as I see it. And as long as I do that, I'm on solid ethical and moral grounding. And when there are people out there who are paid to say things they do not believe and I, I personally could not do that. Um, and that's one of the funny things about these days all of a sudden being told I'm a member of the establishment and I'm you know, part of this Georgetown cocktail party set. And all. I, I hate all that stuff and I have very little to do with – I've never – I think I've been to one cocktail party that happened to be in Georgetown in my life. Um, and you know, I spent most of my time as a pundit like Howard Hughes with Kleenex boxes on my feet in my basement writing about fascism, right? And the idea that the author of liberal fascism is secretly trying to endear himself with, with the sort of liberal elites I find very hard to swallow. Um, and uh, so yeah, no, I, I, I get very weary of that aspect of Washington but I'm also – I just don't interact with a lot of that. Um, I have friends that I made in Washington 20 years ago and that is about 75 percent of my friends. Um, and um, I try to get out of Washington a lot. My wife's from Alaska. Uh, we try to drive cross country a lot. It's a very healthy thing for people in my line of work to do is to drive across this country because you learn first of all, it's a big friggin' country. Um, and second of all, you learn or you relearn um, that most people don't look to Washington to solve their problems or to define their lives. And that is something a lot of people in this town really don't tr – I mean they may understand intellectually but they don't understand on an emotional level and they think what happens here is vastly more important than it really is. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughts, P-O-D. FreeThoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org. Thank you.